it still excites me, you know, even, what, four years on from winning the Edgar, I still look back on it with some wonder because uh, I, I went, when they said I was shortlisted for that prize, and I thought, well, this is beyond all expectation just to be on the shortlist. And I was thrilled to be this. I would have died happy having been on an Edgar shortlist, but to have won it. Um, it was great. Mm. Well, now I'm going to make it really difficult by saying, <laughs> this is so American and so un-British to do this, but I'm establishing her credentials for a particular reason, because I have some questions to ask her, and I want you to think of her as the authority. <laughs> In her next novel, her third novel, Manette then won the Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger Award for the best novel in England. So three books and the three major prizes saying, basically, this is, this is the best. This is the best writer that we have this year for best first novel. This is the best writer, the American crime writers judge, and now the best writer for the year, the best novel anyway, uh, that the British Crime Writers Association judges. So you know, I guess my real question to you is, did you panic? After winning three, where were you going? Uh, did you freeze? <laughs> because Val McDermott did mention to me that after she won the Gold Dagger, she really went into a freeze frame because she was so worried about expectations. You know, would people find her next novel disappointing? Could she even write a next novel? Yeah. Did you have any reaction like that? Well, I, it was worse after I won the John Creasy. I mean, that's when I had my, my worst. I don't think I ever panicked. I simply thought, this is going to be a short <laughs> career. <laughs> Quit with three. <laughs> yeah, but no, with one, you see, winning the John Creasy. Because I thought, how can you ever you can't win a prize again. I mean, this you've won a prize with your first book. How are you ever going to match that? And uh, so I, I was terribly concerned, and particularly as I wasn't writing series characters. And so I was writing this completely different book, completely different story. Um, and I thought, it's, this is a nightmare. You know, nobody's going to like the second book. And, the, and also, I suppose I thought that winning the John Creasy with the first story with all those characters, I thought the only way anybody would want to read anything of mine again was if I was writing a sequel to that first book. Well, as I was by that time, oh, 75 percent of the way through The Sculptress, and I couldn't sort of go back and change it all to use these, the characters from the ice house. And yes, I did. I sort of, well, I think I just resigned myself to the fact that at least I had won a prize <laughs> with with my first novel. I didn't even know if The Sculptress would be published because, um, you know, it took a while for the Ice House to sell. Um, and so I, I wasn't that convinced that I'd, they'd all jump on and say, this is wonderful, The Sculptress is great. But they did, and that was what was so thrilling. So actually winning the Edgar and then the Gold Dagger, in a way, sort of merely proved that I wasn't a one book wonder, so I felt better. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> better after winning the I think it started to get a bit ridiculous though when with the dark room because I got shortlisted for the gold dagger with the guy the dark room and I thought this really would be a nightmare. Actually not that I expected because I thought Val's book was was definitely going to win that one. But it, I thought it uh, it would be awful to win four because then where would what would you do? Where would you go? Absolutely. Yeah. You, you really would almost yeah. have to retire exactly. or switch genres yes, or do stuff. So. Let's go, go before <laughs> you hit the abyss. So, no, I think the John Creasy was the worst because I was such a novice at that stage as well. I, I, I really knew very little about publishing and about, well, writing in a sense. I mean, you know, because it was the first novel I'd ever written. So I think I, I got most worried then. How did you resist writing a series character? I realized that you had gone on and, and had, I presume you had a story for the sculptress in mind, and that's why you were working on it before it was sold. But have you had pressure to go back and write a series? And if so, how have you resisted it? Well, yes, um, but, but you see, every single book that I've written, uh, people have said to me, "Will you? are you going to take this, these characters on? So there are now five books, and each one of them according to publishers and, you know, free, I mean, I don't know whether you know, but The Ice House and The Sculptress have both been filmed for television. And now I get the BBC, you see, saying to me, mm -hmm. am I going to, will I give them ideas or will I write a sequel? I think the more you write and the more people want you to keep going with the characters in the last book, 
it's it sort of um, vindicates my uh, desire not not to do it because it means that they all have an attraction and it means that each book I write hopefully the characters will always be attractive even though they're not the same characters as I went with before but I think it means you have a slower build in terms of um, you know career and readership I mean had I say stuck with the, the characters in the ice house um, you know I think it's much easier for publishers then to say the new Catrell or it, if I'd got with the ice house or the new Scarpetta or the new Moors you've they you know that every time you're, you're building you're building with that character so I think it's it's it takes longer to get the trust of readers if you are changing each time but having said that if you get the trust of the readers I don't think it's you don't lose them mm -hmm. you know once you've got them um, and they because they then go back and read the others and they think wow you know okay I like the ideas it's the ideas they want and the characters and the perhaps the depth so I think you kind of hook them even more than if you're writing a, a series so it has its you know upsides and downsides did you set out deliberately to write a mystery when you sat down to write The Ice House? You had done some work in romance, you had edited? Yeah, I'd Fill me in, because I'm, I'm not yeah. sure I recall exactly <laughs> what it was. Well, I was, when I left university, and I'd written a lot at university, uh, but completely unpublishable, very postmodernist. <laughs> and uh, I decided I needed a bit of uh, training, really, mm -hmm. um, and also some money. And I thought, well, I'd try and put the two together. So I got a job in magazines and I started out as a, a sub-editor come journalist, features writer, uh, which was very useful. But it wasn't until I became editor of a romantic fiction magazine that I then launched into writing fiction. And uh, what the, the, the way the magazine was set out was it wasn't a, a magazine as such, it was a series of titles and each story uh, had to be 30,000 words. They were novelettes, oh. so sort of long, short stories, really. And they, had, they were very tightly structured, so that there was no sex. Kissing was only allowed on the last page. No strong drink. You could only, if your couple were going out for the evening, <laughs> they had cocoa. <laughs> 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 and... Uh, the girls had to be virgins, which meant they were usually about 17 years old. And the men had to be um, men of the world, which made them about 35. Well, now, you know, you try and write something halfway realistic with those ingredients. Absolutely impossible. But um, I was editing these things. I had to find eight titles a month. Um, I did hospital romances, which meant you had doctors and nurses. So you had these kind of rattled old <laughs> surgeons of 35 years old with very, very suspicious <laughs> backgrounds. They couldn't, you see, they, there was no way they could have girlfriends in their past. Um, so <laughs> I yes. see the impossibility. It, exactly. Bad, yes. And then you had these sort of, you know, 17, 18 year old sweet nurses who fell in love with these men. Um, and you had to have a story of 30,000 words using that and following it through. And I was reading this stuff that was being sent to us. And sometimes I'd have 200 manuscripts a month, out of which I had to choose, I had to find eight. Well, I, I quite truthfully, out of 200 manuscripts, two might be good enough, might have been good enough to um, uh, publish. And it, was, it became a complete nightmare trying to find um, writing that was good enough because you see it was so difficult and people assume that writing romance is easy mm -hmm. and it's not it's actually quite hard and particularly when you have those kinds of restrictions imposed upon you and uh, so people would send in the most frightful stories <laughs> that were not properly plotted they weren't thought out the characters were two lumps of wood because you see there was no kissing right. so and they, cocoa, yes, you <laughs> and cocoa. so you just had mm. two two lumps of wood who kind of spoke to each other and of course this is not this has no charisma about it at all and nobody's going to bother to turn the page 